Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. And for those who are joining from the U.S. and Canada, good morning. Welcome to M&M Q1 FY 23 earnings call. We are indeed glad to have you all on this call today. We'll follow our regular format of presentations by management, followed by Q&A. During Q&A session, please use the raise hand option, as there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions as of, after the presentation concludes. Uh, the safe harbor statement, um, you know, uh, I'm just leaving it on the stay, uh, screen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, I would like to welcome our senior management and uh, thank them for taking the time for this call. We have with us today, Dr. Anisha, Managing Director and CEO, Mr. Rajesh Yajurika, Executive Director, Auto and Farm Sector, Mr. Manoj Bhatt, Group CFO, and other senior management, including the IR team. Now I hand over the conference to Dr. Anisha for the management presentation. Over to you, Anisha. Thank you, Sriram, and good evening, everyone. It's great to have uh, all of you here today. Thank you for taking your time uh, to be with us this evening. I'm going to just cover a few key messages and then uh, hand it over to Rajesh uh, to take us through the details. He's done some fantastic work uh, in both the auto and the farm businesses. And uh, then Manoj will walk through the financials and we'll open it up for Q&A. In terms of some of the key messages, at the standalone level, uh, you see revenue up 67%, uh, driven by both auto and farm. At the standalone uh, pivot uh, PBIT level, uh, quarter one is down 120 basis points uh, overall, driven largely by farm. We haven't seen the benefit of commodity prices flowing through the numbers as yet, uh, which we should see soon. And uh, that has been offset by a very strong operational performance in auto with volumes uh, really driving operational leverage. And therefore, the PBIT there is up 400 basis points. At the Standalone PAT after EI level, uh, it's up 67% as well, again, driven by combination of operating leverage and cost control and offset to some extent by commodity price uh, increases versus last year at the same time. And consolidated PAT after EI, we see a very significant increase at uh, 5.2 times last year. But uh, just uh, to be very transparent on this, a lot of it is driven by the Mahindra finance phenomena we saw last year, where we had high provisions in the first quarter and they were reversed in the subsequent three quarters. And therefore, we are also showing numbers excluding Mahindra finance, which is up 1.7 times, which is in a sense a more uh, reasonable number to compare with, uh, just because of the volatility of provisions that we saw for Mahindra finance last year. So as you see on the numbers here, revenue, up to 19,600 crores, which is up 67%. Uh, profit after tax, after EI, at 1,430 crores, up 67% as well. Consolidated uh, profit after tax, after EI, uh, including Mahindra Finance, which is the reported numbers, at 2,196 crores, up 5.2 times. Uh, but a more reasonable comparison excluding Mahindra Finance, is at 2,071 crores, which is up 1.7 times. And across the four segments that we've been reporting now, uh, core auto and farm is up 56%. Uh, TechM and Mahindra Finance, you see a negative last year, which was driven largely by Mahindra Finance, up to a significant positive this year. The growth gems actually have a good story, and uh, they're starting to... Uh, fire up really well. So from 8 crore PAT last year, they're up to 132 crore. Investments does include Forex and others. So while you see a significant change from negative 19 to positive 184, uh, we just want to highlight that 163 is a one-time Forex mark-to-market gain, uh, driven a little by the volatility in uh, exchange rates and some of the hedges we put in. So it, it's overall, we've got some gain there. But the real number to look at there is positive 21 as compared to negative 19 last year. Uh, so across the board, we see good progress on our businesses as we're driving scale, driving growth, driving profitability. With that, Rajesh, over to you. Uh, greetings all of you, morning, evening, uh, wherever you are. Good to connect with you again uh, on 
the back of a good quarter. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so let me walk through the farm part of the business first. We gained 0.9% market share in quarter one. This was the highest uh, domestic volume with the volume of 112,000, and that was a growth of 18% year on year. This is the highest ever export volume with a volume of 5,000 and a growth of 26.7%. The second highest ever water profit, uh, PBIT, and uh, that number 1,074 crores. And again, uh, continued positive profits by our global sums. On the auto side, uh, we delivered a strong market share. We measured now revenue market share where we were number one and uh, with the market share of 17.1%. This was also the highest ever water volume for both SUVs and pickups. Uh, we had a, again, continued our number one position in last mile mobility electric three-wheeler business with a 74% market share. The highest ever quarterly three-wheeler volume, so 6,500. And of course, a very strong booking pipeline of 25,000 within the first minute and 100,000 within 30 minutes, representing a booking value of about $2.3 billion uh, that have happened already on the Scott View. Uh, this slide uh, captures the auto farm uh, revenues. In quarter one, the standalone revenue grew 67%. The consolidated revenue grew 57%. Next. The quarter profits, PBIT, uh, grew 50% standalone and 43% consolidated. But you could see the big kick in on the auto side, which is the 103 going to 704 on auto standalone. Next slide, please. I'm now getting into the farm equipment business. On the farm equipment business, uh, the sequential performance uh, was represented 55% growth in revenues standalone uh, and a margin improvement uh, compared to quarter four of uh, 15.7 going to 16%. The absolute profit going up by 58%. Uh, the news on the monsoon front is good, though there are deficits in some states that you see out there UP, Bihar, Jharkhand, West Bengal. Uh, the acreage is by and large similar to the same period last year. So we, that's not something which we are concerned about at the moment. Next slide. Uh, the reservoir levels are uh, reasonably healthy, higher than the average by 39%. And uh, that is uh, typically good news. Uh, you know, even if the monsoons are delayed a little bit, the reservoir rolls, uh, levels do kick in uh, to help uh, create positive sentiment. Next. Some of the key levers we have, as you see here, we've covered this in the past, a strong fortress in domestic business, uh, the aggressive growth plans we have in farm machinery, global expansion, and reinventing our cost structure. Uh, we launched the Mahindra UO Tech Plus, that's doing very well in the market. And uh, both the brands, Swaraj and Mahindra, are well positioned, gives us a gain of 0.9% share. Uh, the channel number of tractor dealers continues to be strong and we continue to have a strong channel presence. Uh, the export volumes have been growing consistently and we've continuously been delivering on a strong uh, profit uh, performance for these global subs. Uh, specifically by way of global subs, I'd like to highlight uh, the performance of Brazil, where volumes were up 46%. We now have a 5.2% market share in less than 100 horsepower. And this has been the highest quarterly PBT at uh, Brazil. Turkey's done well. Market share is up at 7%. And it's also the highest uh, quarterly PBT for both the tractor business and the factory in Turkey. Next, please. On the automotive business, uh, we've been talking about delivering and creating a strong brand. Multiple actions have happened uh, over the period of the last one and a half years to create this strong brand value. Uh, we are working on a platform strategy with great commonality and also an EV strategy. Uh, we're working on transforming our customer experience, de-risking our supply chain, and also continuing to optimize on costs. This uh, slide represents uh, where we are by way of open bookings and current level new things coming in per month for our portfolio. Without the new Scorpio N, the 
open bookings is a hundred and forty thousand, out of which seventy nine thousand is on the seven double O. In spite of a very long wait period, uh, the new bookings continue to pour in at a level of nine to ten thousand more per month. Next, please. Uh, I, I think I'm going to skip this to save time and give more time for question and answer. This is a launch video and it will be on the site. So if you like, you can, you can take a look at it. It just captures some moments out of the launch. Uh, the blockbuster launch uh, of the Scorpio, and uh, we covered that a little earlier. And uh, again, since I've covered it, I'm passing on this slide. Next. Uh, this is new data that we're putting out today. Uh, the online bookings have kept going up uh, over time. First with the launch of THAR, it was 5%. With 700, it was 13%. And on the 100,000 bookings that we've had on Scorpio N, 26% were online. Interestingly, the first 25,000 bookings, uh, in that 72% came in online. And uh, that really represents a very strong impact that digital is creating in the way customers are booking and buying vehicles. At the bottom, you also see that uh, the Scorpio N has uh, got stronger by way of its representation in the south. The current Scorpio, which is the black bar, was almost insignificant in south and very strong in east. And we can see that that shift is happening by way of uh, the new Scorpio being more south focused, which really opens up new geographies. And you can see that as well by way of the urban penetration for the new Scorpio as compared to the old Scorpio. Next. Uh, we, you know, we know you all of you have a lot of questions on our EV strategy and we've been holding on to our responses, wanting to make it more comprehensive. And uh, we will be revealing more about our strategy on the 15th August. It will be at 5 p.m. Indian Standard Time when we'll have the webcast. As a lead into that, we have two teasers on currently, and I'd like to play those for you, please. With that, I'd like to hand over to Manoj to walk us through the financial. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, a warm welcome to all the participants and thank you for joining the call. Uh, I'll just quickly cover some of the key numbers. Uh, uh, I think the revenue growth of 67% is driven by auto. I think the revenue growth there was in excess of 100% and the farm division grew about 26%. At the EBITDA level, again, uh, while farm was flattish, I think we did see a very good growth coming in the auto uh, part of the business. And at the PAT after EI level, again, we are seeing a, a multifold jump in auto profits, uh, while farm has been growing about 7%. So that's a quick breakup of the numbers. Uh, moving to the next slide. Uh, if you look at the consolidated view, again, uh, the auto is leading about 102% growth. Uh, the farm FES grew about 17%. Uh, I'll spend a little bit, little bit more time on the group companies, but multiple group companies have shown very good growth. I'll talk a few uh, about a few unlisted ones. So we saw very good growth in our MFCW car and bike uh, franchise. I think that grew almost uh, two and a half times in terms of revenue. We saw a very good growth in Axelo, which grew about 88%. And then uh, our listed uh, entities, I'll talk a bit more, but I think 
this quarter we have seen very very strong growth and strong rebound in revenues across the group uh anish touched upon it uh, i think uh, in terms of the reported numbers while it's 5.2x uh, i think uh, if we exclude mmfsl uh, and the adjustment bar you see there that takes the revenue uh, the pad to 1251 if i exclude uh, mmfsl because there was a loss booked uh, due to the exceptional provision and looking at that number it's a 1.7x growth in profits uh, i'll dive a bit deeper and this is uh, more from a perspective of what to expect in the coming quarters uh, on the left hand side you see the provisions we took in mmfsl and as we took the 2500 crore provision in q1 uh, we did recoup it over the next three quarters so what happens is as we pick up the pat uh, on on the consolidated uh, books i think we will see the impact of this coming through so what would happen is that uh, the pat from mmfsl will grow significantly as we go into the future quarters so the growth numbers uh, i think when we say 1.7x i think we have to keep that in mind and that's more from a perspective of uh, transparency and disclosure and we are very happy with the performance of mmfsl and i'll talk about it a bit more i think first on farm um, overall 17% growth at the pivot level it was flat uh, and the market share was up 90 bips to 42.7 uh, i think the margins have taken an impact because of the lag impact on commodity prices i think even in april and may they were higher than uh, the previous quarters and we have not been able to pass on the margin on the commodity uh, through the price hikes so all of that have impacted margins uh, but the market share growth has been very very healthy uh if you look at auto uh, again uh, at the cost of repetition a very good growth in revenue and a multifold improvement in profits uh, uh, and rajesh did cover some of this so in the interest of time i'll i'll just move forward i think coming to techm uh, uh, so from a revenue perspective and a deal momentum perspective it was a very strong quarter uh, tcv wins of 800 million plus which is at the top end of deal wins if i look at the last few quarters uh the attrition also started to moderate quarter on quarter and offshoring is on the rise uh but the margin pressure was due to the supply side headwinds uh, uh, in terms of both uh, usage of going outside for talent on subcontractors as well as uh, the increasing wages for for uh, the employee population and there is a measure on to drive the margin expansion and drive cash conversion up and those operational excellence measures uh, will bring up the margins as we go forward mmfsl i think uh, if we look at uh, the disbursement levels i think they compared to last year same quarter i think they are up almost two and a half to three times and they continue an upward momentum even sequentially going from 9200 to 9500 crores approximately the gnpa which was uh, uh, very high at 15.5 which is why there was a huge provision we had to take i think that has moderated down to 7.7 in q4 and we continue that uh, lower level at about 8% uh, and that means if you look at the profit after tax i think what was a loss has converted to a profit of about 223 crores in q1 f23 little bit on our other subsidiaries i think uh, uh, in in logistics we did complete the meru acquisition so these numbers incorporate those uh, on the revenue side we saw very strong growth because i think uh, across the board uh, the exposure to auto and farm uh, both m and m and others that drive uh, drove the growth in terms of revenue uh, in terms of costs i think there is a lot of initiatives on to uh, bring up the profitability of the business and that will play out in the coming quarters hospitality uh, while q1 f22 is probably not very comparable because of the covid wave uh, i think uh, uh, what we are seeing is uh, very very high occupancies almost record occupancies across resorts and driving resort in income as well as memberships uh, i think the hcro which is our european business has also started seeing occupancies improving 
and the cash position continues to remain strong. Uh, from a real estate perspective, uh, while last year was impacted, but this year we have seen a rebound in profitability. Uh, the, the main factor here is, of course, that from a realization and rate perspective, we have seen a good uh, improvement. That's also led to some re reversals of impairment provisions, which we had taken in the past. That's also contributing to the profits. On the, on the business side, I think the IC business delivered again, both in Jaipur and Chennai, a very strong growth. And we launched Project Eden, which is India's first net zero energy project, which saw a very, very good response. Summing it up, I think uh, uh, if you look at the journey from 424 to 2196, I think Auto and Farm contributed 512 crores. TechM and MMFSL uh, was about 882 crores, and I did talk about them separately. Our growth gems was 124. Our investments was about 204, and I think we covered it that there is an element there of, uh, of Forex and others, which is also in embedded. And then there was a lesser EI this quarter, uh, which is contributing to a 50 crore increase. So thank you, and I'll hand it back to Sriram. Um, thank you, Anish, Rajesh, and Manoj for those presentations. We now open the floor for uh, questions and answers. Uh, Participants are requested to limit their questions to one at maximum. If there is any follow up, uh, please do that. Uh, you may come back and queue uh, for further questions. Uh, we already have some questions on lined up. So we will first start with uh, Gunjan Prithiani of Bank of America. Gunjan, can you go ahead with your question? Team for taking my questions. And congratulations on the Scorpio and launch. It's really impressive to see these numbers. Um, uh, the the first question from my side is essentially on the capacity for UVs. Now, clearly there are order backlogs. And if I look at the bookings run rate, it is still running ahead of the capacity number for XUV 700 as well as Scorpio N, which we, you know, which we spoke about at the time of the launch. So realistically, can you give us some sense as to how do we think about the scale up of the volumes? How soon can it happen? And, uh, you know, you know, just in terms of trajectory, how, where do we get from this 28,000 run rate? And uh, what is the real bottleneck? Is it supplier ecosystem? Is it de-bottlenecking at your end? Is it, you know, semiconductor? What is it really that is needed to scale this up? Rajesh? Then, you know, we are struggling to answer this question, which is coming to us from all of you. Yeah. So let me try and uh, build some more detail into this response. So we have two sets of issues one is uh, for current capacities running into short-term bottlenecks which is mainly supplier ecosystem including at the moment uh, in quarter one all the challenges that we've had out of the lockdowns that china went into uh, so that that in a way is inability to meet current requirement and when i'm talking about current requirement uh, I'm adding the fact that most of the bookings that came in, came in for the highest end version. So the level of electronics needed in the higher end version is much higher. As you know that uh, we've shared earlier as well, even on XUV 700, 95% of the bookings came for the AX series, uh, which has a smart core. And 70% of the total bookings were on AX7 and AX7L, which is the high, are the highest end two versions. Uh, which are above AX3 and AX5. So, so that has put, uh, in a way, you know, restrictions on uh, being able to fully leverage the ecosystem. So that's, you know, one part of it. I don't think at the moment we are losing too much by way of uh, ecosystem not delivering, but my guesstimate will be because of all the China lockdown and so on, maybe uh 10 percent of our uh, volumes are getting impacted because of short-term shortfalls once that's taken care of then the question is by when do we have multiple new capacities coming in and that as we've shared last time have all been triggered they will start coming in phases at this point of time uh, we had not planned to share what is going to be the phasing at which new capacities will build in 
uh, but maybe it's in some appropriate uh, forum in future we can build in a little more clarity around how we are thinking, seeing the ramp up of volumes uh, through the calendar year 2023. Uh, so basically in the short term, the way I would think about it is we are constrained because of managing the ecosystem, including semiconductors, China, lockdown, logistics challenges, so on and so forth, uh, to the extent of maybe 10% of what we are doing, which means that 27,000 can be 30,000 plus. Uh, it does not fully solve the issue that we have at the moment of demand being so much higher than our supply capacity. Uh, so, you know, I'm not sure what exactly is going to be needed to be able to ramp up to that level. Uh, because with, let's say, 70,000 plus open bookings of 700, there's a huge backlog there. Uh, that itself is almost 10 booking. Every month we're increasing the backlog. Uh, because we're getting more bookings than the current capacity and that's coming in even with a two-year wait period so really at what would we desire we would desire to not have a wait period more than three months or four months so if we were to kind of set out and say you know what is it that we think is acceptable from a customer satisfaction point of view three months would be the outer outer side of what customers would accept uh, so that's where we are at the moment. Uh, that being said, we also have to be very mindful as we build. Sorry, I'm just uh, doing a little longish answer to this because I know this is a question which is going to come in, uh, you know, as in the mind of many, many participants on this call as we've been getting early input. So I'm just trying to build on this so that, you know, you get a more, everyone gets a more uh, comprehensive response. Uh, we also be very mindful as we build capacity that we get the balance of EV and ICE right. And again, we that's something we do keep at the back of our mind in the way we are thinking about uh, building capacities. So we are doing that balancing act by way of, uh, you know, the EV portfolio, which you will see more of coming in, in uh, uh, on the 15th August, uh, where we will put out a schedule. But... Uh, in a way, we will, you know, con manage our demand in future through a combination of EV and ICE. So th these are all things at play, but there's a reasonably aggressive capacity increase plan and sometime in future we'll try and be more specific. Got it. No, this is very, very clear to be honest. Just, just, just to be, you know, just a, uh, in terms of numbers, when I think about it, you mentioned 27 can be 30 and 30 plus 6 can be Scorpio, is that the fair way to think about it? Because 27 doesn't include Scorpio yet. Uh, yeah, that's that's reasonably for a good way to think about it. Though there are parts which are common between 700 and Scorpio N. Uh, for example, the Adrenal system is a common part. Now that itself has a large number of chips. Uh, so, you know, till that ramps up, we, we kind of an upper cap of the available on that. So, you know, there are issues of that kind. It's not all exclusive uh, parts that are on Scorpio and it's not completely from a supplier ecosystem standpoint, not completely unconnected to 7 double because of the Adrenox. Just taking okay. that as one example. Okay, got it. And just second question, Shriram, if I may. Um, any, any second question to you on the, uh, you know, on the performance of these subs? You know, clearly there has been great outcome in the last two, three years. But when I look at the, uh, you know, the specifics that came through in the annual report, the two which stood out to me in terms of, you know, still having losses is Pujo and, you know, Pininfarinia. Uh, could you share your thoughts as to, you know, how are you thinking about those two? Is there a rethink in terms of, you know, um, uh, you know, classifying them in category C or, you know, I mean, just some thought process around uh, those two terms. Sure. So, Gundran, on PMTC, we had initially classified it as category A, which is we felt that it would get on a path to 18% return in a reasonable time frame. And uh, what we've seen is that COVID has hit it fairly hard because of various challenges in Europe, challenges in China. The freight from China to Europe. So all of those factors have resulted in performance being worse than what we had planned for. Uh, so the milestones that we had outlined as we had done for all our A category companies uh, were not met. And therefore it is under review right now. Uh, so we are going back and reviewing it saying, should we change it? Should it be A or C? 
and uh, we will come back with a final answer on that once we complete the review. Uh, on APF, it was very clear that we were not investing a lot more going beyond the Batista. Uh, so the Batista, as we've talked earlier, has been reviewed by Top Gear in the UK as Hypercar of the Year. It's actually come out as a very nice car. Sales for that will start shortly in the next couple of months or so. And as sales start, we'll see uh, funds flowing in. So the investments we had to make were to get this up and running. But beyond that, uh, we have publicly stated we're not investing any further in the next set of models. We will uh, look for potential investors and uh, work with investors who we can take, who can take this company to the next level. So no change on the APF front. There, what you see is the numbers are as a result of the Batista sales not starting as yet. Once they start, we start seeing APF getting back on a much stronger footing. But that will not change our investment plan. Got it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Gunja. Uh, the next question is from Ginesh Gandhi, Motila Lorsford. Ginesh, go ahead, please. Yes, Ginesh, we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, so a couple of questions. One is, uh, can you talk a bit more about our uh, product launches on the IC side over the next 12 months on the SV portfolio? And uh, secondly, the EV teaser, which you showed, uh, suggested that we are getting into the coupe uh, range with electric. So how does that fit in our strategy of focusing on true SUVs? Thanks. All right. On a lighter note, uh, Dinesh, before Rajesh addresses this, we've had five blockbuster launches. How many more do we want? Rajesh, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Dinesh, uh, uh, I, you, I think your question was specific around what are the new SUV launches in the next uh, 12 months and uh, SUV ICE launches. Uh, there aren't too many SUV new ICE launches in the next 12 months. As Ani said, you know, we, right now, these are all new launches. We've had three in the last 18 months, plus uh, new, which is the fourth, plus 300, which is not that long back. So it's a fairly refreshed new product portfolio, which is very attractive at the moment. There are other things that we are working on, uh, which we've shared, which is expanding the THAR, portfolio, so on and so forth, uh, making it more affordable, accessible uh, to increase the size of the franchise. So there are multiple other things uh, that we're working on. Of course, we're going to launch uh, the Scorpio Refresh, uh, which is going to be called the Scorpio Classic uh, very soon in the course of August uh, this uh, this month. Uh, there are multiple other launches on the I side, which is the new pickup and so on. You'll hear more about that as we go through. On the question on Coupe versus uh, Bon EV, do wait for more details. No, we're not going away from our core. We will be very SUV-ish. Uh, but electric and SUV is not exactly the same as electric and ICE. And, uh, you know, they they which is the reason we're teasing to give you a sense of what's coming, but we're not moving away from our core of SUVs. Sure, thanks. A few more questions, I'll fall back into you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Janesh. Thanks, Janesh. The next question is from Kapil Singh of Nomura. Kapil, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, Kapil, go ahead. Yeah, yeah hi. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the wonderful launch of Scorpio M. Um, uh, you know, what I wanted to understand is uh, from, a, you know, uh, Rajesh, you've talked about capacity, but just, you know, how you are thinking about it uh, as we head into the next financial year, because, you know, eventually we, we may have 50,000 bookings or 100,000 bookings. It won't matter if you're not looking at a big capacity expansion, right? So, uh, is, is, is will it be in phases as, uh, you know, supply unlocks uh, that, uh, you know, there'll be a 10% increase or something like that, or next year sometime you're looking at, uh, you know, setting up a, a you know, yeah, additional line or something where there'll be a, a big jump that that is there the reason to ask this question is if i add up your bookings you are already at about thirty four thousand a month kind of bookings you're getting without the scorpio n and uh you know uh, maybe i don't know you can give some color as to post the launch of scorpio n uh you know how many bookings we are getting for scorpio classic as well so uh, just some thoughts around that would help so we are looking at a step jump uh, increase in capacity. Uh, there are specific uh, step jumps that are going to happen. Uh, for example, engine capacities have uh, are, are a constraining factor at the moment because 
you know the new lineup of engines is going in the whole entire new portfolio is the new lineup of engines so uh, you know we're we, with the, with our, at our end and with suppliers we are doing that as well uh, so the constraints that we have are less with us more with uh, one is for the whole engine portfolio both gasoline and diesel uh then the supplier ecosystem around uh, the engine and aggregate portfolio uh we don't have to do any significant investment at this point in our own plants uh it is more tooling uh investments and some investments in aggregates and uh, capacities thereof uh the next phase of investments and some of you were in chakan during the scorpio launch you've seen we've just got a new paint shop going so the next round of investments in manufacturing capacity will we can wait for a couple of years and you know we are of course planning for that because that's needed even for the evs but uh, that can wait uh, at the moment that's not the constraining capacity our capacities are not as much the constraining capacity except for engines uh does that couple answer your question on how we think about capacity i i i also wanted to know about scorpio classic you know what kind of uh, demand are you seeing post the launch of scorpio and over there so we have actually not launched scorpio classic yet so we you know scorpio classic is a refresh version of scorpio the so scorpio classic will be launched later in the month so at this stage we are just basically playing down the inventory of the old scorpio okay and uh, second so towards between basically towards the middle of august to and then uh, you know more details on pricing etc towards the end of august for the scorpio classic but okay. as i uh, kapil sorry i'm just taking a second more to respond to your question as i shared earlier in the data a lot of the current scorpio volumes come from the east uh, which is you know the specifically bihar is a very big market and as you saw the skew booking skew for scorpio n is northwest and south and not relatively as much uh, east so we are seeing current scorpio move through in uh, markets of uh, its stronghold belt so it's not like as we have liquidating the old scorpio that stuck okay uh, thanks and the second question is on uh, margins uh, so Uh, in two parts one is that in terms of uh, you know if you could talk about the price increases we have taken in the second quarter in both the segments auto and farm and do we start to see the commodity benefit from uh, current quarter if so have you uh, can you quantify in what range will it be uh, and the second part is uh, that auto margins are at about uh, roughly about 6% uh, how do we th- how do you think about the evolution of these because you uh, on one side you will be launching a new product scorpio uh, on the other side volumes will go up and maybe some commodity benefit would also kick in so uh, how do you see the evolution of uh, margins from here on for autos yeah so um, a lot of the commodity benefit will spill over we are hoping into q3 because you know we have contract we have some inventory which was already on order so on and so forth so really the correction in prices started maybe like may june uh, so we're not going to see too much effect of that we think right now in q2 and we really think the effect of commodity benefit will be more in the second half of the year uh, at this point of time that's that's the view that we have on how commodities will impact us uh, but commodity itself is pretty volatile and uh, you know the correction be fundamentally the corrections uh, Should be more than what we are seeing at the moment is our hope. Uh, the corrections right now are pretty insignificant compared to the kind of hikes we have seen in commodity prices over 20 months or so. On the question of uh, margins, uh, you know, of course, margins are not at the level at which we want because we have not really yet been able to pass on even the full cost of. Uh, uh commodity increases and of course in both the businesses there is the impact of margin not passed on what we internally call numerator denominator effect uh which uh, which becomes pretty significant even as we had done you know bs6 uh, and we spoken about that we were able to pass on uh the com- the material cost increase of bs6 but we were not able to pass on the margin on the material cost of bs6 so that itself you know led to a decline of a percent and a half or two 
so you know there are there is right now a huge cost escalation and you know when we're looking at margins we have to keep in mind that we are not able to pass on with such steep escalation margin on cost we are just about able to pass on cost and uh, at the moment uh, in both the businesses in q2 we've taken taken up between 1 and 1/2 and 2 and 1/2 percent price increase depending on the model okay thanks uh, i have one more question but uh, i'll follow up in the queue yeah thank you yeah let's yeah. go Thanks, Kapil. Uh, the next question is from Pramod Kumar, UBS. Uh, Pramod. Supla Kaswal, uh, handling those uh, elevated customer expectations given the bookings. And uh, uh, Rajesh, first question on farm equipment. Uh, uh, we're going to be around nine hundred thousand as an industry this year uh, if everything goes fine. Uh, so, what do you think will be the ramp for this particular uh, sector as a whole? Because nine hundred thousand per se is not a small number uh, when you look at it in absolute volumes or when you look at it in context of what passenger car volume. Is. uh right uh, so any uh, analysis or data what you uh, crunch which kind of which kind of gives us a bit of more color on the longer term uh, sustainable kega for this in the, for this industry uh, right uh, so if you can help us uh, on that that will be great then i have a question on automotive okay uh so pramod the uh, our outlook for tractor industry this year is in the region of 3 to 5% growth uh, which doesn't quite take us to 900000 it falls a little short if we get in that range of 3 to 5% uh if if your question was around ramp up and supply chain i think that's reasonably covered uh for that level of volume i think your question though is more around what is the implication of that on longer term growth and tractor penetration uh yeah. we we keep updating our uh, analysis on this uh, issue because it's, it's of course very important to how we see the future and typically the modeling that we do is uh, what's the total area that's to be sold how much is mechanized today uh, what needs to be mechanized as we go forward including uh, you know tractor park and uh, hence what's the unsaturated demand and our sense is that with the volatility which this industry will continue to have uh, 78% cagr over the next uh, Seven to eight years is a reasonable expectation based on this penetration gap. Okay, that's great to hear, uh, Rajesh. Second is an automotive. Uh, uh, from given the EV transaction, what we've done and the incremental funding, how we want to raise there, uh, and the ICE portfolio kind of uh, more or less in terms of new brand platforms being kind of played out for the medium term, uh, 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 because I guess the uh, uh, extended version of Thar won't cost you a lot of money. Uh, so given all that, how should uh, how are you looking at automotive cash flows? Because historically, that's been a cause of concern in terms of whether uh, uh, can we go beyond being self sustaining and then start generating healthy free cash flow for uh, for the for the for the company uh, because tractor is heavy on cash flow generation uh, so historically so if you can just share what is your broader thinking given the kind of response you're getting uh, and the kind of uh, margins what we already achieved and where the margin ramp could be how how, how should one look at the cash flow uh, cash flows on the automotive segment because and that could be a that, key you are manual yeah. to take that and and link to that anish uh, on the uh, implication for uh, dividend payouts uh, from the from, from the stand alone business so if you can sorry for that uh, if it's kind of a bit more uh, uh, longer than what you expected but yeah uh, so promote the we do see more robust cash flows obviously driven by the stronger operational leverage uh, capex will uh, move to eb and that's part of what we've shared so far as well which is also why we shared that we feel comfortable with regard to the plans for ev that we have and the capex we need for it uh, after that as well we will have excess cash generated by the auto business and uh, as we have uh, talked about earlier uh, we will not be using cash from auto and farm for investments we will generate cash from investments for further growth there and therefore that will free up uh, greater cash for dividends and uh, potentially return back to shareholders in various forms so it is consistent with what we said so far no deviation from there and uh, as we look back over the last couple of years our first focus was to clean up all loss making entities our second focus was to put us on a path to 80% roe our third focus was to drive scale growth and profitability and the fourth one is to start returning cash to shareholders i think the first two we've done well 
the third one is well underway and the fourth one will start as it does as it needs to uh, so anish no timelines are such even like say medium term uh, anything uh, on the fourth uh, so, part so what i would tell you is we we gave timelines for the first one we met them the second one we gave a three year timeline we are close to 18% roe right now and uh, we should be able to get that completely closed as well on the third path of scale and growth that will be ongoing so from that perspective it's not a timeline where i would say we would sort of stop and say we've uh, we sort of gotten to a point we want because we will continue to want to scale and grow faster exports and becoming a global auto business will be a big part of the future and we can talk about that in more detail and on the fourth part which is timeline for turning more cash to investors i would say within the next 3 years it may be faster thanks lord anish and uh, best of luck to the team thank you thank you thanks pramod yeah. thank you pramod uh, we have another we have question from nazar pramod pramod amte from incred capital pramod can you go ahead? uh first question is with regard to urban uh, pickup truck uh, in the coming future just wanted to know what's your thought because you are a leader in the overall pickup segment what is the opportunity size you are looking at and what you plan to do there that's first second with regard to tractors you have talked about with the implements and new technologies coming the uh, interestingly there will be more disruption and competition expected in the tractor industry which is contrary to the belief that it's a very low tech industry and hence least of the threat for a leader so would you like to elaborate what are you seeing in these two sub segments i commit the pramod the first part of the pickup question i missed can you just repeat what you said in the beginning so the first question so is uh, yeah sure i heard in the pickup the, truck Part, but I just missed the opening line. Yeah. Opening words. You say you have talked about the urban pickup uh, truck, right? You plan to launch uh, urban pickup truck. Uh, so, what is the uh, opportunity you see there? Why you feel there is a specific model required, uh, and what type of a business opportunity it makes sense? Because considering that you are already a leader in pickup trucks. Actually, you know, I read about the urban pickup truck uh, like you maybe in the uh, uh, one of the blogs. So. we haven't really said we are launching a separate urban pickup truck uh, we are our pickup do sell in urban areas today and we are capitalizing building on that we also have a separate portfolio promote of uh, pickup trucks right now that scorpio uh, which gets exported uh, in multiple markets including south africa chile so on and does very well uh, so at some stage future we would look at you know upgrading or updating that portfolio to create what we may call a global lifestyle pickup but uh, that we if we are doing is more for you know our global markets and it will of course have some spill over benefit in india but that's not a primary part of our pickup strategy our primary part of our pickup strategy what i have played out is upgrading our current pickup portfolio uh, to make it more tech and we'll talk more about that you'll hear more about that over through the month of august as we do the first of that Ramod, uh, did I? Were you there? And could you? Yeah, uh, and about the tractor, the second question you are talking yeah, about the farm, yeah, the farm machinery and implements and the role of tech and competition, right? That was. Uh, yeah. So I would compartmentalize these into two different uh, buckets. One is uh, what's the opportunity on the farm machinery side, and we really think that's a big growth opportunity. We've spoken a lot on that in the past. Uh, we're doing multiple things to strengthen our farm machinery portfolio. On the specific question on uh, competition in tractors, certainly it's not low tech. I don't think it ever has been. Uh, and uh, we continuously, you know, our platforms, Uvo, Novo, Jibo, uh, and the K2 that we are working on are all uh, pretty evolved, very strong platforms, uh, doing well around the world. The current platforms, including North American market, so. they are they are good well be well developed designed uh, tech products uh so we we don't think that we are behind the curve at all on the tech evolution on the uh, side and you will see many things coming out uh, you know as we also start launching the k2 platform over the next year or two sure thank you want to add something on the tractor piece i think you you covered it well nothing else to add Thanks, Alberto.
Thank you. Thank you, Pramod. The next question is from Binay Singh of Morgan Stanley. Binay. Questions from uh, some of the earlier questions on bookings. Uh, with regard to bookings, looking at the data, do you have any uh, insight into if at all if there's any double booking or overlapping booking? A customer who's getting one year waiting in one brand shifts on to the other one. Uh, any uh, sort of insight on that? And secondly, in the last call, we talked about 10 15 percent cancellation rate in booking. Uh, any update on that side? Uh, and the last question is just on the automotive margins. Uh, I think in November last year, we had talked about almost 300 basis point of uh, uh, expansion room in the automotive margins from the levels at that time, which was around 3.7% or so. Uh, since then, we've seen commodities actually moderating, but volumes going up. So any uh, any sort of um, uh, any aspiration on the automotive margin? Okay, let me take the auto margins uh, question first uh, and Manoj, step in if you want to add something more to that. So when we're saying commodity prices cooling off, it's a very, 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 very relative term. Uh, it is cooling off from the escalation that happened in Feb, March, post the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, it is nowhere near cooling off compared to the kind of escalation that we've seen over the last 18 to 20 months. And, you know, this is... Uh, published SIAM data, so uh, you know that's very accessible. You can see the shape of the curves for the critical commodities. You know there may be sharp corrections in commodities which don't have a very significant part of the bill of material of automotive, but in primarily what's going into automotive steel and so on and so forth, the uh, the corrections are not that high. There is also of course a dollar exchange rate uh, which is not favorable to anything that is imported at the moment because we've also seen a adverse impact on foreign exchange at the moment or material cost wherever there are uh, any anything that's come getting in, imported uh, that being said there is a very sharp focus on uh, improving our cost structure and we have shared earlier in the year f22 compared to f19 we brought our fixed cost down in auto and farm by about 900 crores in absolute terms so it's not a you know system cost percentage impact which of course is very significant but in absolute terms we brought that uh, about 900 crores down in quarter one this year again compared to quarter one of f19 we brought absolute fixed costs down we're comparing f19 because you know we in a manner of speaking that uh, it was the one year where everything was steady state uh, before COVID kicked in or BS6 transition started coming in and so on. Again, we've reduced over 200 crores of fixed costs uh, on quarter one of F19. So there is a very significant correction that we've done on the fixed costs. A lot of work is going into improving the or doing value engineering of our current model. So, you know, the overall cost structure is continuously improving and that was the 3% that we had uh, spoken about earlier, which is strengthening our cost structure. That makes the business leaner and fitter. And at some stage, the commodity cycle will significantly correct. And I guess that's when we we'll start seeing the upsides, real upsides translate into margin of all the actions that we're taking. Uh, Manoj, do you want to add on? I think, uh, you touched upon the fact that we had mentioned 300 uh, basis points in the medium term. And uh, I think there are multiple pulls and pressures, but uh, from our perspective, uh, it is important that uh, we will look at uh, what can be done in this area. And uh, as and when, I think there's a revised view on margins. I think we'll come back and talk about it. Uh, as Rajesh mentioned, I think uh, the first half of this year, I think considering our current contracts and uh, other factors which are a lag, I think we we will probably look at the second half in terms of what can be done in terms of margin improvement. But at this point, I think we'll remain with what we have said. Yeah, and you know, I just want to add to the point on my auto margins, you know, this whole thing uh, in some of the negative comments that we get around our pricing policy, there are two people who do recognize that we are being very transparent and being very clear about the price protection that we are announcing and offering. Uh, so, you know, the second round of XUV 25,000, is still getting completed, right? So now once we've committed to protecting 50,000 at a certain price, uh, that does have an effect. Uh, and as soon as that corrects out and we complete that, then we move into price prevailing today. 
So, you know, there are all of these. We went through that on THAR as well, where we protected right for a very long period of time. Uh, we're doing that on 700 as well. Uh, in the case of Scorpio, and that's not, I mean, it's a learning out of each experience that the price protection is only for the first 25,000. Hopefully, we'll be completing that by the end of the calendar. Right. Uh, and, uh, can I, can I, I'll take your first two questions. I, I'm just going to connect the two, which is the double booking and cancellation. Uh, so, I don't think double bookings is very prevalent in cities which have don't have multiple dealerships. So, that's not so common. Uh, that is there to some extent in metros where, you know, customers will be booking in a couple of places. Uh, typically, I'm now connecting this to cancellations. The cancellations rates remain the same, which is uh, in the region of 10 to 12 percent, depending on the model. Now, when uh, that's the cancellation rate for a period of time as new bookings are coming in, uh, to our mind, there's a lot of double booking we would have by now started seeing much more cancellation. So, uh, our sense, I'm sure there's some double booking. I mean, that's to be expected. But I don't think that's going to be very disproportionately high percentage. If I was to just throw a number, there's no real way to validate because we do uh, get a KYC of each and every booking. Uh, so right. every booking has a KYC against it, not a random booking. Uh, for every booking, there is a KYC. So there is a genuine customer, Aadhaar, or whatever else against uh, the booking reference. Uh, so we don't think it will be more than 5-10% of the total, if there's at all a double booking. Okay, Th thanks for that, Rakesh. Yeah. Thanks, Vinay. The next question is from Chirag Shah, Edelwein. Chirag. Yeah, we can't hear you. Chirag. Okay. Uh, then probably we'll go to the next question from uh, Jay Kale from Elara Capitals. Jay. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, Jay. Yes, go up, please. Yeah, uh, so my first question is regarding the tractor uh, margins. Uh, so if you see, uh, we are probably at, you know, quarter one is at LIFI volumes. And historically, we've seen it, uh, LIFI quarter one volumes, not necessarily uh, entire any quarter volumes. But we've seen historically that we've been able to protect our tractor margins quite well in that uh, 19 to 21 odd EBIT margins range. Uh, but this time, despite the industry being at uh, such healthy levels, we are... You know, hovering around that 16, 7, uh, 16 odd percent uh, margins. Uh, how do you see that going forward? What is the pricing power that the industry has currently uh, with such high volumes? And uh, uh, how do you see the path uh, going forward to say around uh, back to 90, 20 percent EBIT margins? Uh, Jay, so two parts to the question. Uh, I, I think part of uh, the question is also related to the sequential margin where, uh, you know, we've shown some improvement, but there may be a view that why would that uh, sequential margin growth not be higher. So, a couple of points to think about. One is uh, we are going through the effect of uh, the margin not passed on even in between Q4 and Q2, and that alone on Q1 has a 0.5% uh, percent impact. Uh, so, that is one factor. The other is we have, of course, not yet, even in Q1, been able to pass on all the material cost increases that happened in Q4, and, they, you know, they've rolled over into Q1, which is impacting us. Uh, the model mix in Q1 was not as uh, positive, so there was a negative model mix impact as well. So that's just explaining, uh, you know, in, by way of key levers, what's happened to margin in Q1. Uh, going forward, we really have to see what's going to happen to commodity prices because in a way with the kind of increases that have happened in the last, uh, you know, 12 to 15 months, we've lost more than uh, three, two and two, more than 2%. If you just to compare F22 to now, uh, we've lost 2% on margin not passed on. So if you were to reconcile, uh, you know, 4% margin, 2% of that is just the numerator denominator effect. Uh, and the rest of that is uh, actually the inability because of timing or whatever else, phasing, 
to not be able to pass on all the cost. So, is that margin lost because of the numerator denominator back at what stage? I think we have to wait and watch to see how much commodity price comes down because if when there's a if there's a sharp decline in commodity prices over the next 12 months, then you know the margin will kick in because obviously you don't take price reductions uh, at the same pace as you're not able to take price increases at the same pace. Neither will you bring prices down at the same pace, and then your margin very quickly starts going up. Uh, so you know it's it's not as direct an answer as you're hoping for, and uh, we'll really have to see. I think to get margins back to the levels at which we were as a percentage, uh, we will have to uh, see a much much bigger correction in the commodity cycle. Uh, margins would improve in the second half as I alluded to earlier, and Manoj has been talking about as well. But to come back to the earlier levels, commodity cycle needs to correct much more. Absolute profits, of course, so, you know, we, we are seeing, as you saw, even in Q1, we are able to churn out very good absolute profits, and this was the second highest absolute profit for uh, FES. Got it. Great. Uh, thanks and all the best. That's all from us. Thank you, Jay. Okay, thank you. I understand uh, we have three questions in queue, Sriram. So, uh, what we are scheduled to end now, why don't we take the three questions in queue yeah. after that, please? Thank, thanks, Anish. Um, the next question is from Itesh Goyal of CLSA. Itesh, can you go away? Uh, my questions are basically uh, twofold. First is actually on the commodity price. Sorry to harp on this again, but if I look at the spot commodity price, spot steel price, which is the main component tractor, right? Also in SUVs, if you look at that uh, cost, it is at least uh, 15, 20 percent below the contract prices of the auto companies which they have seen in this quarter as per the steel companies. And even if I look at international steel prices, they are significantly down than down down the. Uh, Indian spot prices also. So we are quite, uh, I'm quite surprised that companies are not talking about a big jump in margins uh, from third quarter onwards when the contract comes in uh, re for renegotiation. So is it because that you guys are looking at macro situation and maybe looking to pass it on or you're seeing pressure in the industry because of competition? Can you just talk about that? And my just on the second question, can you give us some sense on the farm implement revenue in this quarter and FY22 revenue? Because that is a piece which you are really focused on and that could grow multiple fold. We don't talk about it much. So if you can get, give some color on that also. Yeah. Um, Manoj, do you readily have the figure of farm machinery? I, I can just open it up. But last year was in the region of 400 odd crores. I, do we want to share uh, quarter wise or? Give an update uh, uh, at the end of the year. Uh, that's what we've been doing. Uh, but unless uh, uh, Anish, uh, if you want to expand a bit more or you want to expand on the strategy a bit. Yeah, I would just say on farm machinery that uh, we're looking at a significant growth from where we are right now. Uh, in this quarter, we are on track in terms of where we want to be. Uh, and I'll leave it to Manoj as to when and how he wants to share the numbers. So he does it consistently across. Manoj, maybe we should not wait for the full year. Maybe at least do it at the six month mark so that we can start giving a progress update on this as we go forward. Uh, and then if required, look at doing it every quarter as well. But uh, at this point, all I'd say is there is significant opportunity. A lot of actions have been taken. It's moving on track. Uh, and uh, there is a lot more work to be done. Sad that quarter on quarter, we grew about over 35% in the farm machinery business. Uh, multiple things that play in farm machinery business. So, rotovators, we are doing very well. We're gaining market share very rapidly. But a critical revenue driver in the farm machinery business is what's called tractor mounted combined harvesters, acronymed as TMCH. And that has been extremely slow because of, you know, uh, the situation in Andhra, Telangana, so on and so forth. That fresh season starts in August. So, we'll see, you know, how, how that so, uh, you know, farm machinery being uh, some of multiple smaller subsegments, uh, it sometimes there is a slowdown for a given uh, subsegment of farm machinery. So, it becomes very difficult to generalize uh, when we're looking at farm machine numbers. But we have a very aggressive plan for this year, and as I said, we are broadly on track for that. Uh, and Rajesh, there was a uh, 
prequel to that question yeah on the commodity prices if you know i think manoj can answer if you know on the steel prices how do you are looking at because is there a difference between auto steel and the spot steel price that we are looking at because i believe there's a significant improvement expected on margins so so i think broadly speaking i think in q2 we will uh, the prices will come down but i think uh, as i have mentioned before i think we are looking at the situation in terms of the various pulls and pressures so uh, if i look at the margin equation so number one is uh, if i look at the new models and uh, there are there is the xuv 700 which is coming out of pricing which will be better for the second half of the year the second is there is a scorpio n which is a, has been launched so the first 25000 will be at at a lower margin so, so so when we are saying all this that's why we are saying that we will probably update at the end of the next quarter uh, in terms of our guidance of that 300 bips so we don't want to change it every quarter uh if the commodity prices continue to remain low i think uh, as we mentioned before i think the second half will be better margins so 300 basis point from current margins right that is what we are saying no no 300 basis point is what we had said at that point when it when the margins were about 3 and a half percent uh so that's that's the baseline right okay uh, and finally on uh, sorry just on the farm equipment side have you given a figure of 10x increase in revenues in 4 5 years in farm implement space somewhere Because somebody yes, told me about it, so that's yeah, yeah. So we have talked about that as an a growth number which we would like to target, given that the market is is today not organized, and globally I think the ratio of farm equipment to uh, tractors is is a multi uh, is the ratio is much different. So that we have spoken about as an target or aspirational number. And the industry size is seven thousand crores. Am I right right now, including an organized organized? uh i think yeah, the about that yes about that let's come about that great great all the best guys thank you very much thank you next is uh, amin pirani from jp morgan amin uh, did you want to get chirag back yeah next is chirag uh, rajit okay. after this chirag will close with chirag yeah and couple wanted to come back as well so why why don't we add couple as well then yeah sure Okay, go ahead, Amit. Hi, yeah, sorry. Um, I actually dropped off in the middle, so I'm just going to ask a question. Maybe it has already been asked regarding your tractor guidance for the year, because there are a lot of volatile moving parts. Uh, so uh, what could go wrong? I mean, obviously, sowing is a bit slow, but rainfall is okay. Um, you know, uh, uh, reservoir levels are fine. but uh, what what are the risks for this year uh, you know for the remainder of the year even though the ask is not very high and uh, how do you see uh, you know uh, the demand uh, obviously you've talked about medium term growth which is still quite healthy what are the risks that we should watch out for for the remainder of the year thank you um two three things one is uh, what we often call terms of trade for farmers not favorable at the moment the input inflation is for the farmer higher than the output inflation so that's one thing we are closely tracking uh the other is the government spending in agri and rural has come down significantly over the last few months and that is a key parameter as well so these are the two risks that we would watch for keeping all of that in mind we believe the industry growth for the year will be in the range of 3 to 5% something changes positively on either of these parameters then uh, of course it's different there could be an upside so sure. thank you thanks a lot okay chira i think your line is unmute unmuted now can you go ahead yeah thanks a lot for the opportunity again so two questions uh, one on the international farm subsidies that we have now if you look at over last few quarters a uh, revenue number as well as ebit number is largely in a range uh what is the way ahead and what will it require for growth as well, or margin expansion or both how to look and what is the time frame that we have said internally for yourself to achieve those targets uh chirag in the short run actually this is a very good performance given all the challenges that international markets are facing in the last 6 to 8 months there's been huge escalation in freight costs i mean you you tracking that and uh that is a significant impact on the ability of each of these companies uh 
you know, we, we ship tractors from Japan to US, we ship uh, tractors from Korea to US, from India to US, we've seen huge freight increases uh, everywhere. So, so that is one adverse factor right now in the global scale, which prevents a very uh, quick ramp up. Uh, some uh, downsides on the Sampo business because of the current European situation of operating in some parts of the world, which we've kind of constrained ourselves around. So, so you know, these are a couple of things that we keep at the back of the mind. Mitsubishi was affected by China lockdown because they do get some portion of their parts from uh, uh, China. So, while each of the businesses are still doing well, and you saw, you know, big upside in Brazil, which, which is doing extremely well, uh, some of the larger businesses are not able to get the upside. Uh, because of uh, inflationary pressures. Okay. The second is uh, is on hybrids for the in the UV space. Uh, your views and are you actually working on it? You may not be that positive as a space, but you are developing a product as a plan B if it does well in India. Uh, you are developing the capabilities. So, any any thoughts on that? Because a large, uh, a large competitor of yours is betting big on hybrids. So it's very interesting that uh, two different participants of industry are thinking different ways. Uh, we are at the moment very focused on our EV strategy, Chirag. We are not working on a plan B for hybrid at this stage. Uh, not commenting on the uh, moves of our competitors and uh, you know they will also look at where they are investing and what technologies globally uh, the what we are responding to is what we've seen as a very strong focus on the government of india to move towards a high level of electrification of fleets including three wheelers and in our case suvs and that's the path that we are staying focused on and delivering uh outcomes in anisha I, I know you would want to add on to yeah i would just add that in most global markets as well, there is a very strong trend towards EV. And EV really solves the problem around a greener environment. And therefore, our approach also is follow what's happening in global markets, <laughs> follow uh, what the government is pushing, and really have a solution that is a full solution, not a partial one. Yeah. Thank you very much. And all the best. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you, Gerard. Uh, then uh, last question is from uh, Kapil. Kapil, can you unmute? Okay. Maybe Kapil has dropped off. Yeah. No, no, I'm there. I, okay. uh, thank you. Uh, Rajesh, my question is to you. Uh, just wanted to understand uh, that BSX phase two will be coming up uh, next year. So in terms of costs for uh, any of your segments, uh, is there any disruption uh, that could be there for, let's say, segments like diesel or, or petrol? Uh, if you could just give thoughts for LCVs, SUVs, uh, that that's that's first part. And secondly, in terms of uh, what we are seeing is CNG costs going up substantially now. So you do, do you think there'll be a, uh, there's a potential for much faster transformation towards electric in, say, categories like three wheelers or pickups? And and how are you preparing for that? Yeah. Uh, so so couple uh, on the first. Uh, let let me uh, take the second question first. So the CNG the CNG is clearly you know the, this this so cyclical that three months back everyone was scrambling to build all the CNG capacity was needed. The market was moving so rapidly. Uh, towards CNG and that slowed down dramatically, like you rightly said, because the price cost parity equation has changed in the last month and a half or two. Uh, it would strengthen the EV story in the commercial vehicles as well. Uh, so, uh, so yes, we see that as an upside, but that being said, you know, this equation can change reverse again. Uh, so we have to keep our EV strategy, I mean, sorry, our CNG strategy intact. Uh, as we prepare for the future, so you know we have to juggle on uh, both on both the fronts of uh, keeping EV going, but also being ready with CNG. And we are ready with CNG, so 
uh, it just becomes harder for suppliers because there's so much volatility and uncertainty around the supply around the supply side. Uh, Kapil, do you mind repeating your first question? I've uh, not completely got that. Yeah. So what I wanted to know for uh, as we move to uh, BS six phase two, which is real world driving emissions. Uh, will the cost increase be substantially higher for diesel segment? How are you, uh, or how are you prepared uh, for uh, both SUV as well as the pickup segment? We are prepared well, uh, coupled from a readiness point of view. Uh, the see the cost, the cost is not abnormally high. We've shared that last time as well. Uh, so we will be able to, you know, handle the cost issue. The key thing is the number of new regulations that come in in uh, you know ps 6.2 is one of them and as we prepare for that and if there's a legislation around uh, mandated six airbags all of these are adding to the overall cost pressures uh, in the market even if we are able to pass these on then the margin on that doesn't become so easy to do and you know this has been happening continuously over the last two and a half three years which is creating margin pressure in the industry as a whole, where there's multiple causes of inflationary pressure. And then while we do try to pass on the cost, the margin doesn't get passed on and then that drops the overall uh, weighted margin of the business. So that's one of the challenges that we'll have to grapple with as we move. But if this cost comes in, but you know, commodity pressure uh, comes down significantly, then it becomes very easy to pass it off as well, because then, you know, customers got used to a certain price point and you're able to absorb it. It's when all inflationary pressures are happening at the same time, uh, that's when uh, this, these costs start becoming a challenge. Uh, so sure. Yeah. Basically, what I'm trying to understand is, is the cost increase in diesel going to be so large that hybrids become viable? No. no. Okay. No, it's not, uh, it's not that much couple. It's, it's not going to make any difference from that perspective. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, with that, we come to the end of the conference. We thank uh, all the participants, especially since we do the Q1 calls late in the evening since we have the AGM in the afternoon. Thank you for participating in large numbers. And also thank, I uh, thank the entire management team here for, uh, you know, making time and being here for, at the end of the second day of continuous board meetings. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone.